I do want to thank uh, the worship team for doing a wonderful job today, Pastor Roger and Dina as well. May I use this, Freddie? Are we good? Yes, yes, we're good now. Okay. Uh, yes, as I was saying, I do want to thank the worship team for leading us today and Pastor Roger and Dina as well. And uh, what a powerful song. Our God is indeed a way maker. He is a promise keeper and he is a miracle worker. And I like that refrain that says, even when I don't see you, you are at work. Even when I don't feel it, and truth be told, sometimes we feel that God is so far away, we don't feel good about what God is doing, but still God is at work. And so I do want to welcome all of you to our Sunday service, special word of welcome to our friends joining us online. This is the second Sunday in Lent. Can you believe it? I almost said Advent again, the second Sunday in Lent. And uh, it is a time where we come before the Lord and we spend this time in soul searching. We spend this time in spiritual preparation. And we spend this time moving on that journey to the cross, moving closer and closer to the cross. And uh, Pastor Roger and I will be leading a series on uh, what is called giving up. And uh, today we will be leading a short reflection on giving up control, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. But uh, we will be looking at several aspects and features and facets that we need to give up. Now, I know that you heard stories of people giving up all kinds of tangible things like Netflix and uh, social media and their coffees and their candy. And uh, yes, uh, Loga, I'm looking at you, people giving up their candy. Yes, and all that kind of thing during Lent. And, uh, but our series will focus on the intangibles, the internals. The things that uh, have to do with uh, our mindsets and our attitudes and some of those things that we need to prayerfully consider giving up. And so today we look at giving up control. And I want to thank Ted for reading that passage for us. And I want to begin with a little story about a little boy in a Sunday school. And this was Lent and uh, the teacher was asking the class, now class, Lent is upon us. And uh, may I hear from you as to what you are planning to give up? And one boy put his hand up and he said, Miss, for this season of Lent, I plan to give up my veggies or my vegetables. <laughs> now, parents understand what that means, the struggle we have to make sure our children get all their vegetables and talk to Angela about the struggle. She'll give you the detailed commentary on that. But when we have to give up something that we don't like, then it is easy. We all have our quote unquote veggies, things that we don't like, things that we don't like to talk about. And any Lent, anybody asks you, will you give this up? If it's that veggie category, we would say, yes, I gladly give it up. But when it comes to matters that are close to us, when it comes to matters that are important to us, matters and features and aspects that we cherish and hold close to our heart, when we are told to give those things up, then that's a different story altogether. And so today I want to talk about giving up control. Now by giving up control, I don't mean the control in the bad control freakish way. You probably know of friends who we refer to as control freaks. They want to make sure everything is in place and everything has a place, so on and so forth. I'm not talking about people like that. And if you're type A, obsessive, compulsive kind of person, this sermon is not for you. There is another sermon that we will do for type A people on another Sunday. This reflection is for lesser mortals like us who would like to have control in the sense that we would like to make sure that everything is in place. We have the information that has come, we have the data that has arrived in a timely fashion, and we know everything we need to know to be on top of things. Now, if we are not in control in the sense that if we are not 
privy to some of these bits and pieces of information and we are left in the dark, we all know that we feel very uncomfortable because we feel we are not on top of things. Now today, what I want to do is as we look, as we journey through this season of Lent, I want to look at certain aspects of giving up control. And I want to address this topic by looking at uh, a very popular passage in the Word of God, which Ted read for us. It's very popular. We've done it in Sunday school. If you've taught Sunday school, you have used this passage. It's a great passage that talks about Jesus calming the storm. But I want to use this passage and approach it differently. I want to use this passage and approach it from a different perspective where we recognize that here were the disciples and here was Jesus and how they journeyed through this whole atmosphere that required lots of change. And so for our reflection, I want to look at three faces. In this story that Ted read for us, I see three faces and phase one is where the disciples are in control. Now, as the story unfolds, you gather that our Lord Jesus Christ says, let's go over to the other side. That is an important note in passing, that it was not the disciples' idea to say, let's go on to the other side. It was our Lord's idea, and then you will see that in verse 35. And then they cross over, and then they are journeying. And the Bible tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ was fast asleep in the stern. Now we know that he must have been very, very tired. And this is a reference to the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was both human and divine a hundred percent. And we see this beautifully depicted in the Gospels. But in this passage, we see the humanity of our Lord. If you read the preceding verses, you get into chapter 3, you will recognize that he has been teaching quite a lot. He's been preaching, he's been busy working miracles, casting out demons, and so he was tired physically, and he soon fell asleep. And then the Bible tells us that there was a storm that broke out. Now we are still in phase one, and what is phase one of my story? The disciples are in control. Now one must remember that of the disciples, at least four of them were professional fishermen. And if I were to ask you a silly question, where do you fishermen spend most of their time? You will be like, they spend their time at sea or in the water. And when you're at sea, storms are part and parcel of life. And so when the storm first broke out, the fishermen are like, we've handled this before. We've handled hundreds of storms. And for all the boys from Galilee who were part of the discipleship group of our Lord, these were good boys from Galilee. They had gone up and down the Sea of Galilee. There are some of us here who joined us on that Holy Land tour. And you got to give me a smile to say you remember. Yes, I get the smile. And we had the privilege of seeing the Jesus Boat Museum. And there you will see uh, uh, the real boat. I mean, not the boat that Jesus and the disciples were in, but a type of boat that was used during that period. And uh, if you remember that sight and that scene, you will remember it was a large boat. There was enough room for somebody to sleep. And so our Lord is asleep. The storm breaks out and the disciples are still very confident that they can bring this under control. The Bible also tells us that there were other boats with them. And so they had friends. And so in storms like this, they all had a working system. They had a little drill even perhaps. And those of us who've been camping, those of us who've gone trekking with regular friends understand what I'm talking about. We go, we have fun on those camps, on those hikes, on those treks. But because we've been together with the same group, we also prepare for an emergency. And we've been through those storms, those difficult phases in our hikes and in our camps. 
and we've got this drill worked out. You handle this, I'll handle this, you take care of that, and it works like clockwork. The point I'm making is that these disciples had encountered numerous storms before. So they were very much in control. And life is like that for us, isn't it? We go through life, everything's in order, uh, the finances are coming in, the boss has extended his or her favor towards us, our health reports are good, relationships are good, everything is going well. Do we have storms? Yes, we do. But over the years, we have mastered the art of handling storms. Why? Because life is full of storms and we have encountered them. We also have supportive friends like these men had from the other boats. They came together and extended a helping hand. That is phase one. The disciples are in control and we can all relate to that. The second phase is Jesus is invited to take control. That's the second phase of the story. Now the storm continues to rage and the boys from Galilee recognize that this is no ordinary storm. In a storm, the equation is very simple. If you're in a boat, the quantum or the quantity of water that comes into your boat has to be less than the quantity of water you're bailing out. So maybe they had their clay bowls, their jars, I don't know what they used, but they realized we are losing control. And that's phase two. They recognize this is no ordinary storm. We are fighting, we are doing all we can, everybody's supporting us, but we are losing control. And then they decided to go and invite the Lord Jesus Christ to take control. Now you must agree, or you will agree, that the manner in which they invited the Lord Jesus Christ to take control was not very civil. It was not a well-crafted invitation, shall we say. If you read that verse, they said, Lord, don't you care that we are perishing? But still, it was an invitation that was genuine. It was an invitation that was desperate. They said, God, we need you to come and help us. If you don't come in, then we are done. And we can relate to that, isn't it? We face all the normal storms of life and we are in control. But suddenly there comes a storm and it's not going away. You do everything you can and suddenly you realize I do not have control over this storm. I am losing control. And that's when we turn to Jesus. And we say, Jesus, if you don't come in and make a difference, then I will perish. And sometimes in our desperation, we make invitations to Jesus like the disciples did. And what did they say? Don't you care that we perish? And we have had our moments, haven't we, when we've talked to the Lord and said, Lord, why don't you care for me? Why are you doing this to me? But still, our Lord in his grace, in his compassion, he sees our heart and he knows that we are making an invitation to come. And he comes in, and if you go back to the story, when our Lord comes into the boat, he speaks peace. There is peace and there is a sense of calm that is restored. And everything settles down. This is still phase two. Now this story reminds us, if anything else, that storms give us or provide us a sobering reminder that when we think we are in control, it is only an illusion. In fact, there's a whole study done on the illusion of control in our spiritual walk with God. But we won't get into that now. Illusion of control. When our Lord comes into our lives, we see as the Lord is invited to take control, they recognize that Jesus is everything to them. And even today, when we decide to invite the Lord Jesus Christ to take control, we are saying, Jesus, you mean everything to me. And that's because he is all we have. He is the only person we can turn to.
When we invite Jesus to take control, we are saying to him, I recognize that you are, I am who I am. We remember the words that our Lord spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14. The Lord said, I am who I am. Now, the English teachers amongst us will know that sentence is grammatically flawed, but theologically very sound. I am. And that's what our Lord Jesus Christ told in the New Testament. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And so when we go through the storm, when we invite our Lord Jesus Christ to take control, we recognize him as the one who is the I am who I am not the I am who we want him to be. And uh, I have referred to this, big, uh, this book before, but this is uh, a book by Pastor J.D. Greer. And uh, he is the pastor of the Summit Church in North Carolina. And his book is titled, Not God Enough, Why Your Small God Leads to Big Problems. It's a very interesting book, and I'll give you some of the titles of the chapters, not all of it, but just three chapters. Here's one title of a chapter, The God We Crave. And isn't that true? We crave for a certain type of God. We create a certain image of God, and that's the God we want. Another title, The God We Hate. And in that, he talks about the fact that when God doesn't come through, when and how, when in our time frame, then we hate that God. And here's another title, you don't get your own personal Jesus. You cannot customize Jesus to suit your own situation because this is the Lord of the universe. I am who I am. And here's what J.D. Greer says in his book. We are all guilty of creating a domesticated version of God, a bigger, a better version of ourselves, a God who does not contradict us and a God who can be explained by us. And on this journey, and that is relevant to us as we talk about Lent, the journey to the cross, and Greera says, and on this journey, we have become over familiar with God and lost that sense of awe and reverence for God. So when we invite Jesus to take control of our lives, to come into the storm and take control of the storm, we are inviting him to have his full sway. And when we invite him to take control, we discover things about God that we did not know before. We receive revelations about God that we did not know before. Getting back to the story, what's the last verse that Ted read for us? Some of you are like, why don't you ask Ted what he read? <laughs> But what's the, last, what's the last line? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, when Jesus is invited to take control of our storms and our lives, we see something about God that we have not seen before. These disciples had seen Jesus the teacher. They had seen Jesus the miracle worker. They had seen Jesus the healer, but now they get to see Jesus, the one who has power over nature. And I believe that this will be our experience as we continue to trust God with our storms, as we hand him control, we will discover things about God, about Jesus, about our own faith that we did not know before. And now I come to phase three after the storm. After the storm, when there is peace and calm, our Lord Jesus Christ asks the disciples two questions. What is question one? They're both found in verse 40. Why are you so afraid? Question number two, do you still have no faith? Question number one, why are you so afraid? Jesus was telling them, explore the source of your fear. Why is there fear? In other words, Jesus is saying, look at who's with you. I have been with you right through on this boat. I have been with you all this time, so have no fear. 
And Jesus tells us the same thing today. We all have our moments of fear. If you say that I have never been fearful, what can I say? I might say you might be from another planet. As humans, we all have our different kinds of fears. And Jesus is saying, why are you afraid? Because I am with you. Question number two of our Lord in verse 40, do you still have no faith? The emphasis is on the word still. You've seen me perform miracles. You've seen me cast out demons. You've seen all the wondrous things I have done. And do you still not have faith? And Jesus is asking us today the same question. You've seen me come through for you in the past. You've seen me come through for you in the past, in your life, in the life as a church. And can you not believe me this time? And then how does the story end? In fact, in verse 40, when our Lord asks these two questions, he is telling the disciples, he is reminding them, don't forget it was my idea to get you to cross the sea. You didn't want it, I invited you. And that's very true even in our lives. It is the Lord Jesus who is leading us. And because he's leading us, we know the outcome will be wonderful. How does the story end? The disciples thought that they were going to perish, they were going to die. But in this story, nobody dies, nobody perishes. On the contrary, two very important things happen as a result of this storm. Number one, the disciples received a deeper revelation of God. As I said, they knew Jesus the miracle worker, they knew Jesus the healer, Jesus the teacher, but now here was God himself who had absolute sway over creation. The second thing that they discovered was, if you read Mark chapter 5, we didn't uh, ask Ted to read that, but just giving you a sneak peek, in Mark chapter 5, when they cross over to the other side, they engage with our Lord in some life-transforming ministry. There is a demon-possessed man by the name of Legion, and because they crossed over onto the other side, they didn't perish, they were able to engage in life-transforming work. And that's how the story ends. It is a story of hope. It is a story where nobody perishes. It is a story where lives were touched because of the storm. And I believe even today, as we, as we hand over control of whatever that's bothering us, challenging us, frightening us, we need to be reminded that it is our Lord Jesus Christ who initiated this journey. He didn't call us, he didn't call his disciples to abandon them in the middle of the sea. He said, I called you and I will see you safely to the other side. And what was on the other side? There was ministry, there was work to be done. And even as we close, I believe that we need to ask ourselves, we need to encourage ourselves that when we invite the Lord Jesus Christ to take control, that we discover more about God and we discover that yes, there is victory. God will take us through the waters, he will take us through the fires, he will take us through the storms, but we will come out victoriously. May God bless the reflection of his word.